Hello and welcome back to the number one podcast in the sport where I said we'd bring different voices to the table and I think we have done so I can say now this is the first ever outside broadcast um, first time I've taken this equipment out of my place um, that was an experience and I'm definitely worth it though so I made the commitment, if you remember, that I'd try and get more voices, more textures. I'd do less of the talking was what I wanted to say. You know, for these next 100 episodes, I'd do less of the talking. But it's taken me about seven episodes to get someone else on. So so just bear with me. But first outside broadcast makes it sound so official. And what I wanted to do was get hold of someone who, to be fair, has been good to me, right? Um, And Alfie Warren's one of those guys who's always been good to me, always shown support publicly and behind the scenes as well. Like, you know, he he will sing my praises to people when I'm not even in the room. So if I can also help him and, you know, expose him to people who may not necessarily know who Alfie Warren is, then it's more than worth it. So let's just frame it properly so you guys can can understand. So Alfie Warren runs Warren Boxing Management. So there's Alfie, there's Freddie. There's Sonny and Bobby. So they're all Frank's nephews, okay? And trust me, it's a separate part of the business, as you'll find out in the interview, different family WhatsApp groups. But they run Warren Boxing Management, and you know they're on the same journey that most managers are. They'd like to build world champions. Um, got some good fighters. They've got Masood Abdullah, good man, good fighter. And he... He does have the potential to to hang at world level, man. I've never seen a kid so dedicated. And they've got other guys. Courtney Bennett fights on WBM shows as well. So Alfie's a guy I know well. Um, we know a lot of the same people. And it was good to actually just sit down because normally we're at York Hall and we go past each other or we're at a public workout or weigh in. And we kind of shoot past each other because we've all got different stuff to do. So it was nice to to sit down with Alfie and have a, a good chat. Like, I think it, what you'll find is that it's just a good boxing chat. Hopefully it's educational in some ways as well. Um, apologies to the people not from London. It's quite London-centric, obviously, because we recorded in London. But I still think it's it's informative and it's interesting. I think Alfie's a good guy, um, wants to do the right things in the sport, a uh, man with a big heart as well. And it'll be interesting to see how that journey goes. Hopefully I'll remain plugged into that journey as we sort of see it progress, evolve and grow. So I want to thank Alfie for for giving his time. <laughs> for context, we were scheduled to start recording at um, 10.30 in the morning. I think we started recording after one o'clock, maybe 10 past one in the afternoon. So by the time I got home, I'd left my house at half nine. I got home at about quarter to four. And normally that would frustrate me. But the upside of it is got to bump into a lot of people from my boxing life and I think I'm going to burn up a lot of time here just speaking about that because like boxing's a small world and the people you kind of bubble up the amateurs with are the people you tend to meet when you get to this stage so it was lovely to see Hannah Rankin at Times Amateur Boxing Club and she was doing some of her publicity for her upcoming fight I think it's in about three weeks so that was that was really really good like got a lot of time for Hannah you know, if you followed the story for long enough, you remember Hannah was one of the guests at our live show. Um, followed the journey well before that from her gym box days. Hannah and I have also done commentary together on a Dennis Hobson show. And so now to then meet in this context as well, it just shows, do you know what I mean? Like you always see the same people in boxing. So look, happy for her. No, it seems to be going well. Um, she's definitely on the hunt for a world title, and I believe she'll get one. And she she deserves it, man. Hannah Rankin is a a great story for women's boxing. I mean, it's just living proof that determination and drive can get you a long way in life. So really good to see her. Good to see Billy Underwood. I hadn't seen Billy Underwood since like the Harringay Box Cup, and he would have been like a teenager back then. So it's lovely to see Billy Underwood. He's up at Times ABC doing his thing. Um, Freddie Warren saw him, you know, family man now. God, I haven't seen him for a while and he's also involved in that. Got to see Sonny Warren, which is also good. So, I mean, got to see the whole Warren clan apart from, I think, Bobby I didn't get to see. Um, have to really, really thank 
Rival Boxing Gym. So Rival Boxing Gym is a gym just by Caledonia Road and Barnsbury Station, uh, opened up by two boxers, Newman Hussein and Amy Andrew. And if if you know the amateur scene in London, you'll know Amy. You know, she's a stalwart of the scene. Uh, Newman, professional, he's doing his thing as well. Um, need to see him out this year. And Amy, I think Amy tried to do the Olympics with New Zealand as well. So she's kind of done the circuit. And you know, now she's fighting for the Commonwealth title in a few weeks. So I wish her all the best. And I mean, the gym they've got is amazing. Fully kitted out in rival gear. Looks amazing. You know when you walk into a gym and it still smells new? Like it hasn't been sweated in yet. So that was really, really good. Lovely to see them. Wonderful to see Maz Abdullah. Like I only ever seem to bump into him during Ramadan, which is a coincidence. But if you want to get behind a boxer, like one of these unsung heroes, almost like a Rocky story, Masood Abdullah is the guy. At featherweight, I think he does a lot of damage to established names. And he won't be far off wanting to terrorize a guy like Nick Ball. Like you saw what he did to Kesh Ashfaq. So, I mean, get behind Maz Abdullah, a guy he's got a lot of time for. I think he's got a bright future in this game. Um, who else? Stevie Broughton. Lovely to see Steve. Um, so, Steve is... Amy Andrews trainer, training Orion Salungu as well, trains Maz Abdullah. And if you know my story, Steve, uh, Steve Broughton is the reason I got in with Shane McGuigan way back when in the, in the mists of time. So I'll always have a, a lot of respect for Steve because, do you know what I mean, he, he was important in that process. And I've loved seeing his journey because I remember when people in boxing were slating him going, we don't know who he is. How dare he come into our sport and think he knows better than us? But now you see him, he's got Maz, he's got Amy Andrew. I'm going to forget all the people you've got, Orion. So he had Big Steph before, he's got Joe Joyce. And he's building a training team around him now. And so watching all of this growth, I love because we all kind of came up together. We're all from that same era. And just forever grateful for that. Um, just, just a really, really, really good experience. And I'm sure I've forgotten people and I probably shouldn't forget people, but you know, my mind's, my mind's slipping as I'm recording. This I you know, I've got no notes in front of me, but I'm grateful. I'm really appreciative of them letting us use their gym to record. And that means I should caveat this by saying we've had to play around with the audio a bit just because we ended up filming downstairs on the jujitsu mat. So that it was quite echoey. So just playing around with the audio, trying to get trying to get a sound that's a bit more compact so you don't hear so much of the airiness. I mean, that's a lot of sliding of, of buttons and knobs and stuff. So if, if it's not sounding like this intro is, bear with us. The content will be worth it. So without further ado, let me introduce the interview with Alfie Warren. Enjoy, guys. Right, I've got Alfie Warren here. We were meant to start this at 10.30 <laughs> in the morning. It's about ten past one in the afternoon, and it's been an adventure, Terry. It's been an adventure already, mate. Um, well, we finally made it happen. So two gyms later, <laughs> yeah. So for context of the listeners, um, I said I'd do, I said I'd do this pod with Alfie just because, be an interesting conversation, and meant to meet at one boxing club at ten o'clock for, for the pod, see the public workouts, you know, the usual thing I like to do, just aimlessly mingle, and then. Couldn't find any power there. Um, nightmare getting in for a start. So couldn't find any power. Nightmare getting in. We've done some running around. We're now at the rival boxing gym, which is just around the corner. And if anyone is in North London, this might be the place you want to come and train if you want to learn boxing. Um, so in the meantime, I've got to have a quick reunion with Hannah Rankin, Amy Andrew, and Newman Hussein, as well as Maz Abdullah, who I haven't seen since. Alfie, you, you like this. I hadn't seen him since the pandemic. Wow. So, we were not, what, probably 2021, 20, yeah. Mm. And I was in Camden, and I, I used to do this crazy thing, Alf, where I used to walk. I, I'd pick a random station, I'd just walk home from there, because there was nothing else you could do, right? Yeah. Load up a few podcasts and just walk. And I was walking through Camden, and I bumped into Maz, Natty Nguyenia, yeah. and Jackie Lee Price. Yeah. Right? Spent, spent about five, six hours together. Brilliant. Because, you know, when you, like, I've known Jackie from the lodge for yeah. years, mate. Yeah. She's lovely, Jackie. But, yeah, yeah. And then I knew Maz and, and Natty from, 
just through boxing, right? Yeah. But never had the chance to sit down and talk. And I was just like, two brilliant people. And then ironically, these are two people who are now with Warren Boxing Management. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Masood, I remember the fir first time I ever seen Masood was at the, um, what did they, the, the Islet used to put the shows on, the National, is it down near, um, down near Houston? It's just off of, off yeah. Of, yeah. So, um, someone, there was a, I can't even remember his name now, it was a fighter from the Reps and someone said, you've got to come down, you've got to see this guy. He is absolutely the business. So I want you to come down. He knows you're coming down. We're going to go and see him. I went, okay. So I went down in my friend. All of a sudden, Masood's in the other corner. <laughs> and Masood absolutely destroyed him. And this Repton guy was supposed to be like the, the next top thing. I'd, I'd love to get his name. I can't, I can't remember it. And um, I remember saying to my friend, um, well, that's the one we should be looking at. Masood didn't see him for a year or anything like that. And we got back in contact and he ended up signing with us. So... I mean, it's a great setup down here. Um, Amy, Amy Andrews, Newman are saying, you know, um, one of the married couples, professional boxers, they've opened up a gym just um, stone throw from where I live, Caledonian Road. So I'm, I'm very pleased for them. And um, just, just to um, talk about our surroundings now, me and Terry are currently sitting on jujitsu mats doing this podcast because. <laughs> Because of technical issues in the... It's, it's been an adventure, though, Terry, but we got there in the end anyway, mate. Mate, you wouldn't have wanted it to be easy. No? I, I, I just... <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah, it, it's crazy. But why don't you tell us about Warren Boxing Management, mate? Because I think people have seen it. And one thing I'm aware of, and I get pulled up for this a lot, Alf, like it can be quite London-focused. Oh, you lot just talk about this stuff because it's in London. But... Like, you're, you're not just London, no. and, and, and especially when we start to talk about Box Nation, I think you're, you're, you're looking beyond the border. So it's just good to give people an overview of Warren Boxing Management, you know, what, what sort of drove you to do that. Because I know, mm. you know what people say, well, he's a Warren, what else would he do? No, no, not at all. Do you know what? I, I didn't ever think about getting it. I wish I would have got into the business earlier, but I think it, when, I got, when I got to about 24, and it was nothing to do with professional boxing, how I got involved. I mean, I was at every single big show. Like, I went there as a fan punt. I used to have a great time and all that. And I see all my family, me, uncle, me cousins, all the guys I work for them. Um, and yeah, just being around those shows. But I never, ever, ever thought about getting into it. And um, yeah, what, what um, got me into it was a friend, a friend of mine called me up and... Um, what he wanted was a famous boxer. He was doing a charity event in Shoreditch and he wanted a famous boxer to come out and give the trophies out. And I remember they wanted one of Frank's fighters, um, Billy Joe Saunders at the time, and I tried to get them, they weren't available. And um, a friend of mine, I don't know if anyone, well, say a friend of mine, um, who I knew but, um, at that time, who was around, was uh, young Anthony Joshua. And, um, no one really knew who he was apart from the boxing hardcores because it was like he, he just come out the world championships. This is before the Olympics, but he was just going into the Olympics. And um, I said to Anthony, "Will you come down and give the medals out?" So when they, when Anthony turned up, they was all like looking at him. No one knew who he was. Like they went, and I said, "Right," and I introduced him because I got um, I got roped into doing the MC on a night as well because their MC dropped out, so I'd, I'd done that. And um, he ended up giving the medals out, and I remember people going. Who's this guy like that? Who was expecting so and so? And he gave out. Went. He's going to the Olympics. He's going to be representing Great Britain. All that. Anyway, they had their pictures done of them. And then, fast forward, everyone's bringing those old pictures out. <laughs> look who we look, look. Look. Look who we had given the medals out all those years ago. But how I got roped into that was obviously bringing Anthony down to give the medals out. I ended up getting roped into emceeing it. But it was really badly run. This show. It was. The, time, the, 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 the guys were supposed to be doing the timekeeping, there was people fighting for four or five minutes, and I was, I, it, it was a disaster, it was all stressing out, I got out, and I got the show, show under control, and the only reason I'd done that was by being, being ran Frank's shows and seeing how it was run, really, and, and I've done that. So, um, two weeks after the event, my friend called me up and said, look, do you want to start doing more of these shows? And all that, and and I never I never thought about it. So I went. Well, I tell you what, let's let's do that. And we end up booking the forum in Kentish Town, which was we thought we. I mean, 
it was crazy what we'd done, but we did end up packing it out, doing the white collar shows, and then once I'd done that show, it was just like, I want to carry on doing it, I want to carry on doing it. So we were doing all these shows, and then it come to the point where um, we was approached by a mutual friend, um, Danny Williams wanted to fight. He just recently lost his British licence um, after he fought Chisora. So I remember we was we said, yeah, we'd love to do that. That, that would springboard our shows up and we'd, we'd attract all the fighters that want to fight on there, all the white collar fighters. And um, we was looking for an opponent for him. I remember we actually um, approached, the first person we approached was a friend of yours, Larry, Larry Alabama, because he just yeah. lost his um, license. Um, he said, no, Danny's my brother, we'll never fight him. Danny said exactly the same, we, we will not fight each other anyway, which is a shame, because it would have been good. And I was at one of Frank's shows before, and I was like, oh, who can we get to fight? And um, big Dominic Negus, who was the security, was there. I remember my brother went, should we ask Dominic? And we'd done that. He also lost his license with the board, so it, kicked, it picked up a big stink. And um, I think that's what really cemented it, that I wanted to get involved with boxing, is because I, it was such bad press about it, because they both you know, lost their licenses. Danny just recently as well. But I didn't know the ins and outs of you know, why Danny lost his licence and all that. And I'll tell you what, I would never advocate it for someone, you know, if, if someone's lost their licence with the board for a medical reason or whatever, they shouldn't be, I, I don't think they should be, should be in the ring if it's down to medical grounds, but I was very naive at that point. But to be fair, Dominic was on the same sort of level as Danny, probably a little bit lower, but I mean, he was more... You know, um, his game is anything, though, isn't it? Yeah, Dominic's game is anything, but I mean, even in the unlicensed, he took the unlicensed shows over, but nothing, nowhere near in the class or caliber as Danny Williams or anything. So we put that show on, and where it's such a huge success, you know, you start getting flash about it. I was like, I could do this professional boxing from home. Like, What's the big deal? I, you know, I, I, I could do this. So I, I, um, I, I stopped doing, I stopped doing those shows, and I had a meeting with Frank. And I said, look, I want to go into the professional boxing game. And Frank's advice was, no, do not get into this business whatsoever. I tried everything. I went, look, I'm very adamant. I want to do it. I want to do that. He went, right. If you do want to get into it, he said, do not be a promoter. He went, I am telling you now, don't. It is it's suicide. It's hard work. Everyone's going to try and screw you over. Everything is like, it's, it's bad. All right. So I said, well, what should I do? He said, why don't you be a manager? He went, manage some fighters and get them on the shows. He said, because what you're doing, I mean, you do have to invest in your fighters, which we do, but it's, it's you know, you're providing a service for them. It's not, you're not going to lose a load of money on what you're doing. And you can just get up there and all you'll do is probably earn. And um, so I went, yeah, so we had to go through the process. I said, so what, how do I go about getting a manager's license? We well, got to hold on to a border control license for three years before you get a manager's license. So I said, okay. Um, and then someone from the office, I went, well, what, what should I do? The seconds license, trainers, I don't know what license to hold. Anyway, so I said, um, whips license. Get a whips license, hold on to that, and work behind the scenes, which I did. And I started whipping the shows, Frank's shows, for, with Ernie Draper yeah. from there. And then I learned to make all my contacts there, backstage, everything. And I learned such a lot from being ran people win the game from being backstage. But for those people who, because there'll be people listening go, what does a whip do? Just just an overview of what a whip Oh, the do. whip, you know, um, he's the guy, you know, who has to work, especially, um, um, they, were, they was the old Box Nation days with Frank, so you're working with the TV company to make sure that the fighters are ready on time, gloves are handed out, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. Everyone says, like, it's a lackey's job, but it's much more than that. Than that, but you're making sure everything backstage is running smoothly, it's running on time, everything. It is. I mean, Ernie Draper used to do it on his own, and I don't know how he used to do it, those big shows. I mean, he was the best in the business then. And um, yeah, I started um, doing it with him. Um, and then Ernie retired, and then I was doing it on my own for a little while. Simon Legg ended up coming in, and um, He's done it, and he's probably the best in the country now, Simon. So, but the, the, the whole reason that I did get the whips license was, for, was was to get that manager's license. And when I did, we signed I, I signed a couple of fighters 
um, on my own. And um, I mean, we had this conversation earlier, Terry. I actually did think, I'm going to sign this one, that one, that one. What can it be? All it is with a manager, that's all you've got to do. Just go to the promoter, get them a, get them a fight. That's when you're fighting, blah, blah, blah. But it's <laughs> much more exactly what I thought that promoting was going to be. I thought that's what managers going to be. My, 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 but and really, being a box, especially with professional boxers, if you've got a big stable, you have to do that full time. And I was finding it really, really hard. It was stressful, everything. And um, you know, I'm very, very close with my brothers. Um, there's, you know, there's um, four, four of us, and they end up coming in and, and helping me. And now, you know, it's not just. Alfie Warren, the manager, is now turned into Warren Boxing Management, the entity, the company, where all of us, you know, all got each other's backs, everything, and, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely worked, and I can't, you know, thank my brothers enough for coming in um, and helping me, because it's growing more and more now. So you're going to have to list the brothers, because... Because people start going, yeah. is it Francis, is it George? No, no, no. no. <laughs> we're, 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 yeah, because we need to know the dividing line in the Warren clan. No, no, no. So, um, yeah, my father, Robert, uh, Frank's brother, obviously. Um, and my my um, brothers, um, Sonny, Fred and Bobby. So, you know, um, we're, we're really close-knit type of things, you know. They're, you know, more than my brothers, we're all, you know, best mates, or whatever. You know, we, we really are a tight-knit. And um, yeah, so like Francis, George, and all that, they're all our cousins, but we're all a tight knit close family. And you know, especially boxing, I think that that's um, definitely brought the family closer together as well, even though the whole family was close anyway. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's where it is. But I mean, just on that, yeah. what happened? <laughs> I was just thinking this just now. What happens in the Warren family group chat when there's been a robbery? <laughs> <laughs> like does does, does, does it go mad? Because I because I do in my head I'm just thinking, some someone gets jobbed and there's like absolute robbery and I just yeah. imagine Frank coming and going, none of you lot know nothing about boxing <laughs> and then he just goes, Frank Warren has left the group. <laughs> well, but our Warren's ones are divided anyway. So I mean our Warren group chat is all down to me old man and me brothers and all that. I'd love to get one together though with the cousins <laughs> of Frank and all that. I think that would. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that would be interesting anyway but I could imagine knowing our family it would be non-stop arguments and all that but yeah, do you know it, it, it's good with our family especially my brothers and all that um, you know we row all the time I mean heated rows sometimes but it's like one of these um, ones you know after an hour or so you know we, we, if, if one of us needs something done after a big argument yeah. we ring each other it's like it never happened yeah. you know it's just let's just get on with it and um, yeah, it's um, it is interesting, now, especially with, uh, the, the half of the, the Warren group chat we got with me dad and my brothers as well. Um, not for the faint-hearted, I don't think. Because <laughs> because I always remember you guys would be in the IFL interviews for ages, and then we'd always be like, "What do these guys do?" And I remember they'd always ask your old man, "What do you actually do in boxing?" Yeah. And he'd never answer, would he? He's like, ah, "Just <laughs> just you know, just show up." Just, just make sure things are all right. And he'd always, <laughs> and he'd always, he'd always have that accent, like that, that real old school Islington accent where you're like, um, maybe don't, you don't want to ask too many more questions after this. <laughs> he's all good, my dad. You know, listen, he's, um, he, he's, worked, he's worked on the shows and behind the scenes for a lot, a lot of years as well, um, you know. Um, and he does, he, 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 t he takes care of a lot of people um, behind the scenes. He makes sure everything gets done. Um, you know, if, if things have to get done, they'll get done. And um, yeah, Rob's your man to, if there, if, if there is a problem that needs um, sorting out, especially on our sides with our fight weeks and all that, and to an extent on Frank's shows as well, if you need something sorted out, it'll make sure it's sorted out. Because the one thing about my dad, he most family orientated person as well. So anything need doing for his family, he'll do, no questions asked. And then just to check, so who was the first person you signed? Do you know, the first person I signed um, was who you just met there, Billy Underwood. Young Billy Underwood come out of the amateurs. Um, I signed him um, officially because I, I mean, up until then, I remember I was co-managing fighters with um, Jason McCauley under his license. So that's where I learned as well. I learned a lot of of Jason and um, and also like Andy Aylin as well up the office and my cousins and all that especially about managing and all that. So, but the first one I signed on my own was Billy Underwood and um, had eye hopes for Bill. 
um, but it was always stop, start, stop, start, and he'll tell you himself it's to his, uh, you know, most of it was his fault, but he was just, you know, wasn't as dedicated now. He's trying to, you know, he's trying now, he's just had a little baby and all that now, and he wants to, you know, get into it and be dedicated, but like what we've said before, you know, if you're a professional fighter, your job is a professional fighter. You have got to stay ready, you've got to be in there. I don't want to hear no excuses, can't get the weight down. You should be, you know, you shouldn't be too far off your weight if you're a professional fighter. I always say that, and that's why I love working with Masood, um, Newman, Natty, all those guys as well. They're so dedicated to what they're doing. They're never, ever, ever overweight, you know, always fighting fit. If I was to say to Newman, I mean, Newman, even Masood, especially Masood now, because he's at that high level. If I was saying Masood, I've been offered a world title fight for you in two weeks, I would have no, you know, nothing would go in my head where I don't think he would be prepared for that, especially fitness-wise. Anyway. Mate, yeah, that's my pet peeve yeah. in, in boxing, where too many people treat it like a sport. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you play Sunday League football, you train Tuesday, you train Thursdays. If you miss Tuesday, like I can make it up on Thursday, you normally can at that level, yeah. right? When you're a professional boxer, you can't get away with that, mate. And, mm. I, and I tell them, I say, if I was ever blessed enough to be a boxer, on God, I'd be in the gym at nine and I'd leave the gym about four o'clock. And in between then, I'd make sure all my work was done. Do you know what winds me up as well, Tell, some, some, along the lines you've done that? You know, I've had four round fighters go like that. Right, you're fighting the four round, right? I better get into camp. Camp? You should be four rounds fit doing everything, when I call you up and all that, what do you need to go into camp for a four round fight for? It's just madness, it's ma- like, uh, uh, it just really, really winds me up sometimes when I, when I hear fighters say that, right, I'm getting in the camp, no, it's a four round fight, you should be doing that on your head. You're doing more round sparring, like, it's, and you probably will have harder stars than what you have from that four round fight. It's just, um, I don't know, especially this generation now, I, I, it's, it's just madness, honestly. But, but it's also the trainers, Alf. Yeah. Um, yeah. The trainers, you know, trainers are quite insecure people in general. Yeah. So then they start panicking. Oh, he's going to fight. What if he loses? Mm. It's, like, well, it's a four you know, round. I, I have that so much, honestly. And I, uh, honestly, so I, I, I ain't going to say names. I don't want to embarrass them, but I've had trainers, you know, I go, right, he's fighting him. No, he's a journeyman. For God's sake, you're supposed to be like that. They'll turn journeyman down. And, I, and, and then they'll, they'll go, we'll accept that one. And I, half the time, I don't even think some of these guys even know what they're looking at or what they're doing. They go, oh, we'll have him. I go, well, I feel like going to him. You explain to me why you'll have him, yeah. but not him. What is the difference between this one and that one? Like, it's just mad. And I, I agree with you um, with, with the trainers being insecure. You know, even at the high level, when I, you know, trainers, you see it all the time. The trainers are turning down title fights, title fights. I don't think as well, I've always said this, I don't think it's that they're, they've not got the faith in the boxer, I don't think they've got the faith in themselves, especially like in shoot, like if there was to, you know, have a fight where it's going to be 50-50 in a shootout, and I don't think they've got the confidence in themselves where they can go back to that corner and they'll know what to do in that situation, say if they have a bad round, get smashed to pieces and come back that round, I don't think but that's what I think, and you know, I try and install that into my brother Fred, who I, you know, who's doing really well down the times. He's times ABC. He's you know training the amateurs and all that. But you see all these fighters now that are not, you know, that are not, they're not doing their apprentice, so to speak. Because I said, I said it to Fred. I mean, you can easily go and get a professional trainer's license and do that. But then you you don't know what you're doing. And some of these trainers, really, honestly, they 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 just jump the levels. You know, they get pally pally with, um, you know, fighters and all that at a certain level and then they become their trainers and all that. And I just think, but I think that that's um, mostly down to some of the fighters as well, because I think the fighters are just comfortable down there because they probably, with those trainers, they probably call the shots with them. And, um, you know, and they, they can do what they do with them. But, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, especially the, the trainer thing. Is, um, I think that's, that's what they're lacking. I just think that people are coming in, they know the right people, they know the right, um, you know, as shall I say, yeah, know the right people, know, 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 know um, get pally pally with everyone, and then all of a sudden they're training high caliber professionals, and it's just, um, it's madness. It's madness. Mate, mate, yeah. We're 20 minutes in and I'm about to start ranting and raving <laughs> because it's, it's, it's my bugbear. Mate, and 
and th that's why I kind of watch Warren Boxing Management with interest because I want to see where that goes mm. with interest. Because if I was managing fighters, I'd be looking at the trainer and I'd be asking a lot of hard questions. Mm. And I'd be like, well, what does it take to get a guy ready for a world title fight? Mm. Okay, why aren't we doing that now? Yeah. Because I don't want him to have to figure out what training for a world championship fight is when he's got one coming up. I yeah. want it to just be seamless, like he's already at that level, physically, mm. mentally, all of that. And then you realize a lot of these trainers don't really understand how to train fighters because, you, Alf, Alf, do you know how they get these guys? I tell you, on God, they go on Instagram, and let's not name names, but it's be pretty obvious what I'm talking about. Mm. They do the silly little pad routines. Someone sees it and goes, do you know what, mate? My body's a bit banged up. Can you just do the pad work for my guy? I'll watch and make sure I'm see I like what I see. And they come in, all right, all right. And then the little chats happen, the mm. little little DMs. That's it. Look, you know what? If we just had more time together, here are the things I could fix. And, and they sell this fighter a dream. And then the fighter's like, yeah, the pad work feels good. Yeah, yeah. And before you know it, you're now training with a guy who's essentially a pad man and you're expecting him to yeah. guide you to a world title. And I say to people, I had this conversation with Porky Russ the other day. I said, if you look at Fraser Clark versus Fabio Waldi, those guys landed about 300 punches, okay? So mm -hmm. 300 punches, let's say at about 25% connect rate. So that's about, I don't know, 1,200 punches, we'll say, between the pair of them. That's 100 punches around. Tenth, fifth of a second, nah, about 0 0.2 second for a punch, I reckon, roughly. Yeah. What about the other 30 minutes? Yeah. That's still boxing, right? Yeah, of course. That other 30 minutes is still being judged. Yeah. Are you coaching for that other 30 exactly. minutes? Do you know what? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I, honestly, you look at it like that, that is true. It is true. And, um, but it, like, even with judges these days, they're saying, oh, it's what you, it's what you look for. But do you know what? So we, we do get some bad judges. But on the majority, they, most of them do know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. You're going to get the odd bad judge you know, on the thing. And you know, some judges might have a bad night at the office and, you know, get things wrong. They're human and, and they do get things wrong. But um, absolutely right with, with the trainer um, situation. I just don't think that some of them are equipped. And that, that is all good. Uh, uh, that's, that's the, sorry, a point going kind off of topic. The point that I want to make, you know, everyone always says this about the promoters and managers, right? About you've got to be careful with them. He's going to try and sneak into you. He's going to try and sneak into you. Absolute point you just made. Trainers, I'm telling you now. It is worse than it's ever, ever been. And, you know, they're all pally pally. They come down to the gym and all that. I've got, you know, you get some, um, you know, I, I've had it recently, you know, um, some, especially like with the amateurs and professionals, someone comes down with their fighter um, to spar and the trainer's running a bit late and they say, to, I've seen the trainer go, get in the ring and all that. Like, I mean, that's a no-go and the, the trainer should know that, but it is and they have... Um, you know, tr trainers are it is just as bad as what people imagine what the managers and, and promoters are trying to get in people's ear. It is really bad. But it, it, it's, it's horrible. Um, like, if it was just men's boxing, right, you'd be like, nah, all right, I get it, I get it. But they're trainers sliding into the female boxers' DMs. Like, I, uh, mate, I get sent this stuff, right? I think, <laughs> I think people generally know I fly straight. Yeah. So they'll be like, look at what this idiot sent me, and I read this stuff. I'm like, oh my God, you're saying you want to train someone, oh, we should meet over a drink to discuss it. I'm oh. like, what, <laughs> what part of the game is that? <laughs> and, and, and mate, that, that's, and that's one of the things, like, and you hear me bang the drum about it a lot. I wish the quality of trainers in London would go up. But one of the big problems, Alf, is no one wants to listen. Like, so I, when I was younger, I played rugby, right? If I'm running a team, I'll call my mate from another club to come and watch the yeah. session. What am I missing? What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? Yeah. And we'll, we'll have a chat, we'll have a beer afterwards, and he'll give me his, his views. That doesn't make me any less of a trainer. He's not going to come and nick my team, is he? He's going to come and have a look, give me his wisdom, I'll go and have a look at his setup. Yeah. You, you'd never get that in boxing. No, I think you're absolutely right as well. They don't want to listen to some trainers, and it's pig ignorance as well. And I, I like I just going back saying that about my brother Fred. Do it the right way. Start off training. The, you know he's starting his training journey now. Start off training the junior amateurs. Start doing that. If anything, if you if you want to be a pro f trainer, get a seconds license. Go in the corners. Listen to what they're doing. 
That's how it should be, because that's how you're going to make a good training. Because, you know, all these trainers, you can get a licence and all that, and, you know, you can have your 15 minutes of fame with these fighters, but ultimately you will get found out at a higher level when you do step up. And the thing about it is, though, when you do mess up at that level, that is when your downfall is going to happen, because everyone, you know, you, you will get exposed eventually. You have to learn. Listen, experienced fighters, experienced trainers like, um, you know... Um, who should I say? Jimmy Tibbs, um, who used to be, you know, um, up north, Joe Gallagher, um, all, all these other trainers, listen, they've had bad nights at the office, they've gone on bad runs before and all that, but what separates it from them is that they can come back, they know, like, what they're doing. That's why these fighters do go to these trainers, but I think with, um, with the reason why some of these high-caliber ones want to choose these trainers, because if they did go to these other experienced trainers, they wouldn't stand for their nonsense and all that. And that's, that's what it is. It is exactly what it is. I've seen it so many times, um, even with fighters I've been involved with. They turn up to the gym when they want. They do their runs when they want. They do that. And they stand for it because they want to be associated. And it is. It's all, it's all social media crap. They just want to be, you know, in, Instagram trainers and all that. That goes with the boxers as well. They just want to be Instagram boxers as well. People, pe people want to say they train. People want to say they box. They don't actually want to do the thing that's it and this is why like when people say to me boxing trainers you respect i always use the name eddie lamb and i love yeah eddie. eddie eddie's lovely fella because if you look yeah. at ed last five years ed's really become public do you know what that's what i'm saying i remember ed when he like the box nation days when he was so young training with al smith and he's a fantastic listen he's over in vegas now training Sky Nicholson for a world title fight how far he's come but i think he's on he's there on merit and how he learned being in, never a head trainer and all that, he, he was a good amateur fighter in his own right. You know, he worked. Um, I believe he worked right like, in the corners for the amateurs and all that. Went on to yeah, he did kettles. Yeah, there, well, there you go. Done that. He done it the right way. I think. You know what? I absolutely agree with you. I think Eddie Lamb's going to be a fantastic trainer. I think he already is. Yeah, I think. I think so. I mean, you. Yeah. I, I, I. I talk about like London fighters. Um, like London trainers, sorry, and all that. I, I actually would put Eddie Lamb in the bracket if I wanted to send a young fighter down there to do that. He has done it the right way, and he's a lovely fella as well yeah. to, to go with it. I, I, I do, and then the other thing I learned in my time was you get these other kind of trainers, like uh, the name I use a lot, people make, make fun of me to say, is like a, like a Chris Smedley, mm -hmm. a guy who, who took Liam Cameron from yes. an 11-year-old lad to a Commonwealth middleweight champion. Yeah. Right? And you look at that and you go... That's a proper trainer. Yeah. Because Chris can do that again. He did it with his lads, like mm. Luke and Nikki Smedley. Um, I mean, yeah. Rest in peace to Luke. But he did that. He built fighters. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of these guys, like I said, the pad routines look cool. They go on the internet. They nick someone else's ideas. Mm. They pad them as, as their own. And you can do that against a journeyman who are not there to win. And then yeah. you get to a certain level where you're fighting people as good as your person. And you I, get found out. Yeah, and uh, do you know what? That's I think what we're lacking in this country as well, because I, especially with these young, young, young guys coming around as well, it's like they'll do the session with them, and that's it. They'll go on their separate ways, and they'll just meet back in the gym. I think we're lacking coaches, not even trainers, coaches. The people, you know, Brendan Ingle was the, you know, it was the master at it. I think, and um, you know getting into that kids as when they're down, when they're that, you know, knowing their moods and all that. I think Billy Graham and um, Ricky Atten was, they knew each other thing. I think he was more than just a trainer, he was a coach to him as well. Like, and, um, you know, so, so, so I, I just uh, I don't think some of these guys, you know, we're getting 20, 20, 22, 23 year old pro trainers, you know, training people for championship fights. It's madness, you know? <laughs> it's, mad, no, no, it's madness, you know, like, listen, that's when you really, you know, you're starting, you think, I, I, I was like, man, I, I, but you know what though, to be fair to you, I, I, I thought that I knew everything at that age, 24, 25, like what I was saying when I was doing the white collar things, I went, oh, I'm going to do that, I'll be bigger than all of them, I can do everything and all that. And you do think, you do think you can do everything, but realistically, when you're at that age, you're not, you're just, you're starting your own journey on life as, as well, really. But when I talk about training people, I always talk about the mistakes I made. The stuff that I thought I knew and that turned out to be absolute rubbish. Yeah. And I go, I went through an initial phase where I was all about hard sparring because I was like, ah, tough environments will make for tough men. Ah, just make it as, as rough as possible. Mm. 
uh, all your bag sessions had to be balls to the wall. And then I just started speaking to other people, mm. um, boxers from other cultures, guys from Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan. And they'd look at you like you're crazy. Yeah. Why are you punch with power all the time? Everyone's different, isn't it, really? Every person is, is different. You know, you put some, you, you, you could have a fantastic fighter who can go all the way and all that. You put them in that environment, like what you just said, like hard things and all that, they probably couldn't hack it, really. It's just, it's just, it's, it's different. It's, like you say, it's, I think it's the ability of um, reading, reading the fighter and seeing what he needs as well. Because not everyone's method is going to work on every single boxer. So that, I, think, yeah. I think that's a talent in itself. Yeah. It is, I, I have that thing. Well, I've, like people have said, you know, would you turn, do you turn into a pro trainer and work with me? And I just go, no. Nah. I don't need, number one, I don't need the money. No, that's right. Number two, are you mentally in a place where you can come round to my way of thinking? Because mm. I have a, people may not like this, but I have a really fixed view on boxing, right? Yeah. I, Wherever I go, I always just break it down as my, my standards, my values, and my principles. Yeah. They don't deviate from anyone. Why? Because yeah. I, I know they work. Mm. And so I say to someone, this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on three main areas, your technique, your decision-making, and your pace. Yeah. Right? Because th that's really what wins fights. All the other stuff is just talk. If you're good technically, great. If you're a good decision-maker, you ain't got to wait for me, yeah. Yeah, which is good. And pace will turn the hardest man into a coward. Yeah, yeah, that is yeah, absolutely. It's not a hard, <laughs> it's not a hard sport to figure out, mm. but these are very hard things to make real. Mm. And when you hear some of these guys talk, you know, I remember when Adam Booth would do it. Mm. The first name I've named today, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the wars already started. But I remember when Adam Booth would talk, yeah. and he'd always talk about these too much jargon and you're like mate what are you really trying to say here is you don't know what you're on about because when, when I got told that he used to take notes from Ishmael Salas when Salas was training hey yeah. I was like oh that's when I started calling him the hoax I was like no no no, no. yeah <laughs> really <laughs> why don't you tell us that then well why is that such a secret yeah and, and it's that's like, what, a, like a copy and paste sort of thing yeah it's an issue and then I was looking and I look at you Alf and I go you're now building your stable as a manager so is your role as a manager to make sure that you get your boxer with the right train? And if so, how do you go about that matching process? Yeah, definitely. I mean, some, listen, um, it, it's whoever the fighter feels comfortable with, um, first of all. Um, you know, I, 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 I will definitely, when, they, when they're starting out, um, set up trials for um, fighters to go down to those trainers and all that. And do you know what? Sometimes I've gone down there and they pick the one that I wouldn't pick. But what it is especially um, with my brothers and all that you have to keep on top of what they're doing in that gym and you know my brother Sonny more than anyone is the man who, who does do that he, you know he he, um, he keeps an eye makes you know keeps in contact with the trainers more so the fighters and all that and um, you know he builds good relationships up with with those fight with, with, with those fighters I mean Sonny and Masood like how they are as well you know Masood would confine into Sonny more than he would confide into me, but there'd be other fighters that are confined more into me than they would. It's, 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 it's different like that. But yeah, especially um, when picking the trainers, I always, um, you know, especially when they're, I mean, when, when they're starting off, you know, I, I, you sign fighters that are already with trainers and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you keep that, keep that there and all that, but you look at it and sometimes, you know, when their performances ain't up to par, you have to have that uncomfortable conversation with them. And you know, the trainers are not going to like it and all that, but it is for their own good. If they're not performing, you know, to, to the standard what you think they're going to perform, and you, like, there's fighters out there that are performing to standards of, like, central area level, and I think, no, I know that you're better than that, but the only reason you are performing there is because you've not got the right people around you, and you do have to have that uncomfortable conversation going, look, I think you've got to move on. Some fighters don't like that as well, because you know, listen, fighters and trainers or whatever, they is they, they, they do they do um, form a bond. Yeah. But some of these trainers, you know, they, they, they're not stupid. They must know that the formula for this fighter is not working. If you really do care for that fighter and it's not working, you know, it, it's, 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 not a, it's not an ego thing. You should hold your hands up, you know, and say, look, I don't think it's working. Now, an example, which I don't think he should ever moved on, was um, Richie Sawyer and Archie Sharp. It was working fabulously. Uh, up and, and then they had like 
a performance and Richard went, look, it's getting a bit stale. And he actually advised Archie to move. He went, look, do that. And he moved trainers and now he's back with Richard Sawyer, which he shouldn't have left anyway. But I think that that's a prime example of a trainer, like knowing that something's going wrong in the gym, going, look, I think it's time to move on, you know, and like for your own good, because he obviously see something in that gym with the fighter that wasn't working and done that for the fighter's own good. And that's very rare. I always use that as an example for Richie Sawyer as well, because um, I, 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 I think that, that takes a you know, good man to do that for a fighter, because there's yeah. other people you know, who want to cling on to that. So. See, but, but then I always look at it from a trainer's perspective, where I'm like, you shouldn't be the same trainer this year yeah. that you were last year. Uh, yeah. Because the, the world, I mean, mate, mate, like the stuff, like I'll read stuff and it'll go, well, actually, if you, if you take this before you train, mm. like it may even be something like, I don't even know, we'll just say like Himalayan sea salt. Oh, this will elevate your levels of this and that. It will help you train. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. And then I might go away and try it myself and I go, okay. I felt something there. Yeah. And you go, okay, that, that might work. And then you kind of guinea pig it with your fighters. But every, everything, you bring a new thing. Like, I'll give you a good example of this for me was, I had a lad I used to train in the amateurs, Ross Boyle. Mm. Um, did all right in the ABAs here, did all right in, in the Ulsters as well. Good guy, like, what, you're one of those guys, corporate guy, but hard as nails, mm. yeah? But before every big tournament, he always needed a new weapon. Not technically, but you know, mentally, he needed a new weapon. Yeah. So you always had to bring something fresh and new with him. He had to train differently, and he, that gave him confidence. Mm. Right? You couldn't give him the same stale thing, or he just kind of moved past you. And then you've got John Pilata, who yeah. I trained as well. And like, he's very, oh, we did this last time, man, and we've got nothing better to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he, he'll, he'll press you. Yeah. And if, you're, if you don't believe in yourself, if you're not developing, if, you, if you're not trying to excel the same way he is, mm. man, he'll just sack you off. Absolutely. But I think that goes for what we're doing as well, management thing. I think, you know, we had a good year this year. We've got to deliver more next year, the yeah. next year, the next year, and all that sort of stuff. Because that's how we, especially as a management company, that's, that's how we're going to propel to get them to the top level, you know, and do that. If we can only deliver them... You know, we, we've got Masood, right, we've got him to the Commonwealth level now, now we've got to deliver this in sponsorship, right? So, um, right, we, 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 we're delivering this sponsorship for this fight, I would say, we've got him £1,000 a year. Right, next year, he's got to get double that, he's got to get that, he's got to get that. That's what we got to do. I think, yeah, it, work, it works in all areas of boxing, but I, I think, yeah, absolutely right. And the boxer, like what you said with Pilata, expects that off you, and that's what the boxers should, and they press us to do that, and that's what makes us better. Absolutely. This is what I say to every boxer. I say, it's your career. <laughs> they're getting paid out of your money. Absolutely. So they're service providers. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to say, well, show me the value you're delivering. Exactly. And then if you're, if you're really about that, you should be fine. You should be like, well, there you go. When you started, you were here. Here's what we've done yeah. for you. That's it. Yeah. That's right. And I always say to them, listen, I always say to all the fighters, when you sign from you deliver in the ring, we'll deliver in, we'll deliver outside the ring big time as well. But you've got to you've got to deliver in the ring. You know, I mean, we work with fighters on all levels. You know, I've got with fighters that are gonna, which I believe are gonna be world champions. I think Masood up there. I think that he's got the capability of being a world champion. I don't care what anyone says and all that. I think barring, I think barring Nick Ball and Lee Wood, who, are, who you know, former world champions. Apart apart from them two, I think that he's the best featherweight in the country. I really do believe that. Um, you know, Nathaniel Collins and Hopi Price, I think he does a job on both of them. And, um, you know, we got, we got Masood at that level, we got um, Southern Area levels, we got, I've got fighters, if they won a Southern Area title, I've done my job. That's like me win, winning them a world title, but we work from a, on all levels. But, yeah, like you say, for, for us to perform as a management and to get more things for them, they have to deliver in the ring. If they deliver in the ring, it makes our job a lot easier, delivering them outside the ring. But, we, we, we work hard from all on every level and um, you know so far so so far so good with our fighters they, they all seem happy you know and now especially with um, Box Nation now making a return you know with Umar as well very pleased for him that he's on that um, he's on that channel and um, so, so yeah I'm gonna ask, so how did that come about and the reason I asked that Alf is 
I heard rumors a while ago that Box Nation was for sale and that people were trying to buy it. And I was like, uh, it's a big brand to buy, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it is. It's, 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 it's very recognisable, you know. It was a pillar of British boxing for years. You know what I mean? Definitely. I mean, that was the only thing that was ever rivaling in Sky Sports at the time. Yeah. Really. And then, yeah, so how, how did it go? Because at the time, like, Box Nation was just kind of this thing that was always in the background of your subscription. And you'd, you'd, you'd watch, you know, if you wanted to watch some fights from 10 years ago, you could watch a lot of really good fights. Yeah. So, okay. And then now all of a sudden we've got the rebrand, we've got new people involved. So how has all that come about? Well, you know, we heard about the new rebrand. We knew that Umar was involved and, and we knew um, a few people behind the scenes that um, are involved with it. Um, especially the shows we've been putting on. Um, we all had a meeting with everyone and, you know, we said, look, we, we want to showcase our fighters on, on the channel. You know, it's, it's a massive channel. I think it'll go from strength to strength. The rebrand, the rebrand, I think it's a very smart move getting Umar involved in it as well. Um, you know, um, he's done a fantastic job at IFL. But, I mean, the, 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 the main objective that I had got with Box Nation, because first and foremost, I mean, like I said to you before, we were saying about, oh, I want to be a promoter. I don't want to be a promoter. I, I want to put these shows on to showcase the fighters that I manage. I, like, this, this project with Box Nation is no way a thing to go, we're going to rival Queensbury and Eddie Earn. It's levels and levels and levels and levels below. No. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's like, it, it really is. But that's not, the, that's not the idea of the thing. The idea of the thing is to put it on, you know, we, we, we've been putting on small shows, you know, with various other promoters and been showcasing our um, fighters on those shows. But for this, you know, it's a platform to see these fighters now. And that's all we want. I, my objective as a manager is, I've said it to every single fighter, I don't want you fighting on small shows. I want you fighting on the big shows, whether it's in the away corner, whether you're getting a contract to be in the home corner. That is where I need to take you on. And to have this now, and for them, which is fantastic for Box Nation to, to do that, is to, to, to um, um, what do you call it, put on small hall shows now. Because you know you see some of these small hall classics that never get the light of day, that are very rarely recorded. You're just hearing it word word of mouth. And um, with this one, I just think it's fantastic. Um, the small hall fighters are going to get the recognition they are. And when they do eventually sign up with these big promoters, and these promoters go, "I want that kid," you know, their their value is higher than what it would have been if they was fighting on a your call show that no one was seeing him on as well. So. So you, you, almost you're thinking about people listening at home now where they'll be asking, so is this a feeder into Queensbury or... I you think, know, yeah, it's a feeder into everyone. But okay. we're, we're, open, we're open to everyone, really. You know, Sky Sports, TNT, Queensbury, any promotional, um, app, any promotional outfit wants to come into to, to talk to one of our fighters. We're open to it. It's not just Queensbury because of the, because of the family ties, but... You know, Queensbury, you know, is, pro it is, it is my family, it is my blood, and, you know, they would always, you know, if, if, if they wanted something, you know, um, a fight or anything like that, I would, I would, I would prefer that I do sign fighters with Queensbury because I know how they work, you know, we've got, we've got, you know, the relationship there, the family relationship there, I would there, but any other promoter wanted to come in, you know, it's not, it's not just, oh, we're, we're Warrens, we're going to work with them. But the thing is, if a promoter comes in and they wanted to work with one of our fighters, don't get it, don't get it twisted. If you sign that fighter and you believe in that fighter, we're with you all the way. It's not, we want you to build them up and we're going to take them over to Queensbury or something because of the family ties. That's not how it works whatsoever. If you get behind our fighter, that fighter is yours and we're behind you and that that's it. You know, that's the way I've been brought up as well. You know, I, I'm, I'm not nothing like that whatsoever I've, I've been brought up to say right listen if we do a deal with you we're all in as long as you're all in we're all in and that that that's how it is that's how my father's instilled it into me and my mother as well that's that's it it's it's, it's nothing you know it's you know you're loyal to us we'll be loyal to you and that's it yeah so i'm going to ask you this question warren boxing management give the fans five fighters and five reasons to be excited by them Right, we already mentioned him already, Masood Abdullah. Um, 
if you haven't already seen him, which I think most of the, the listeners have seen him against, you know, these breakout fights with Mark Leach and Cash Ashfak, he's one of the most exciting fighters in the country. 100% he's one of the most exciting fighters. Um, James Hennigan from Liverpool, um, he's been a bit stop-start, but he is one of the most naturally talented boxers that I've come across. He's reflexes everything. He, he's a joy to watch. He's a nightmare for everyone. I think he's going to have a breakout year this year. He's going to be featuring on our Box Nation card on the 26th of April. So that's fantastic for him. He'll be high up on the card there. Um, young Karim Ages. I really, really, ra- I super flyweight um, fighter who punches exactly <laughs> like heavyweight. He is absolutely exciting. He's, you know, he's had a lot of problems outside the ring now, and he's got, but he's got himself together now. He's up um, training in Brentwood with Yuri Robertson and Kevin Mitchell and all those guys. He's settled in there. You know, that's that's another, talk, talking about um, fighters gelling with trainers. Very, very, very experienced up there, and that's why I like I, I like that set up there with Yuri Robertson and all that. You know, he's got Kevin Mitchell and all that. It's, it's one. It's a big training team, not just a trainer. So it's fantastic up there. Um, who else are we looking forward to? Um, Casey Kademi. Always have to mention him as well because you know he had he had a, he had a great fight in January against the South African for the IBO. It was never his weight, but he had the chance to fight for that title. Went down there. He came up short. And now he's fighting Ryan Farag in April, you know, straight back on it. I love, love working with Casey, he's never in a bad fight. Um, he wins that Commonwealth title again, I think that's him reborn as well. Um, his fan base has stayed so solid with him all throughout, and, you know, we've done a fantastic job with him, and he's been very good with us. Um, fifth fighter, um, oh. Cruiserweight, come way. on, come oh, on. Do you know what? Listen, we work with him, with Costas Evangelou, Ezra Taylor. And we, we, we work with Ezra Taylor. Um, I, I, was, I was hoping for Natty, but all right. Natty, oh, well, Natty, Natty's got to get his ass back in that gym as well, you know, honestly. He, Nat, I, I love Natty. Do you know what? He's, he's, he's a fantastic fight, brilliant fighter. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope he, he had, we had a couple of medical um, problems with the board um, for his last fight as well. So we've just got to get those things um, tweaked out. As well, but yeah, Nat, Natty definitely. I think um, you know if 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 we get what we have to get straightened out and get him yeah. back on the horse, I think that he's good enough to be fast tracked now as well. Not too fast, but fast tracked, and I think he could definitely be a player in the cruiserweight division. Hundred yeah, yeah. percent. Because him and I, I remember having an argument about whether we're related or not, and like, I remember this. We're trying to get deep into. It. I was trying to explain to him because, like, like, in Zimbabwean culture, like your name's kind of your name. Yeah. So if you've got a certain name, like you're from that bloodline, yeah. right? No debate. That's it. And I know on my on my mum's side they married into that family because yeah. I've got cousins with the same name in Gwenya, right? Yeah, like yeah, they're my yeah. cousins, Royce and so forth. I've got cousins. I was like, Natty, we we'll relate. We we can't not be related. And he's looking at me like, No, I don't think we are, mate. <laughs> I was like, This is the in culture. We are related, man. I was like, Look at us. We look kind of similar. <laughs> You're like twins, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, I don't think that. Listen, we we get all, we get everything um, done. I, I love Natty. He's he's a, he's such a character as well, and you know he's he's one of the British troops as well. And um, yeah. people should just get behind him for his journey. And hopefully, we get what we have to get behind the scenes. Um, we, we get we get all that sorted, and he'll be back in the ring. I'd I'd, I'd I'd love to see him back because because I mean he's part of that sort of exciting thing and. Yeah. That whole kind of Steve Stevie Broughton thing, yeah. and like he seems to be coming like almost like the trainer of choice for Warren Boxing Management, and yeah, he, he trains a lot of our guys, you know, Newman, Masood, Natty, you know, he's got Amy Andrews up there as well, who we don't manage, but you know, very very good friends of him, and he's yeah, like we was going back to the thingy, um, but we, I mean, we was, he was having a chat with Amy prior to this yeah. about you know a gym environment and how, and how important it is, and they've definitely got it up there, they yeah. really really have. And um, with, with Steve, he's another one, doesn't do it on his own. He's got a training team up there as well who, who work with him, you know. He's not, he's not um, too pig-headedness to know that, it, you know, it, you, you can't do it on your own. You do need a team. Like, I need a team with, with the management company. That's what's took it to strength to strength. It needs, you know, you, you can't all do it on your own. Even promoters, you know, you look at, you know, Frank and, Frank and Eddie. 
You know, they're the ones that everyone knows. They're in front of the camera, but they've got a solid team behind them. They need you need that. You you do. You need you need people behind you to help you. And I think that's what makes it successful in all walks of life. That's one of the things I've learned in life. Success moves in groups. Exactly. Like, you yeah, no, no one's ever successful on their own. Yeah. You may not see the other people, that's right. but they're there. You you need that. Like, and I don't know what it is, but it's that kind of that group energy. It's why I always found it odd when I'd see boxers get their own gym mm. and it was just them in the gym. Yeah. Because look at Joshua now. You know, Joshua goes to the Ben Davidson Performance Centre. Yep. He's around Courtney Bennett. He's around um, Jamie TKV. Yep. He's around Alois, young Alois the Animal. Yep. He's around young, hungry people. That's it. And you can see his demeanour in the gym. He, he loves being there now. Yeah. You know? And I, I, I'm like, why, why, why would you isolate yourself from that? Like, no. for it years. Must be, it must be a good... Like I say, yeah, because he did used to isolate himself, didn't he? But I mean, being around a, um, like that, and you got and you got these fighters looking up to you, it must egg you on a little bit more. Going, do you yeah. know what? I can't let these guys down. That's that's the mentality that he's got. The same thing. Like, oh, oh, I, I can't be out trained by these guys. Exactly no way. that. Exactly that. Another another point. Yeah. As it, and I yeah, all of that stuff because like Steve Broughton's one of the people. Like if you say to me, people in boxing that you're proud of, right? Mm-hmm. I remember when he first sort of came on the scene with Shane mm. and people were like, oh, who is he, mate? He doesn't deserve this. And then he got to work with David when Shane parted ways. Yeah. And the, the usual hate came out. Yeah. And, the, you know, the, the trainer mafia comes out. Who's yeah. this guy? What's he done? What's he done to deserve this? I mean, I've been doing this 55 years and mm. I don't get breaks like this. And he kept building. Yeah. Didn't make any noise. Kept building. Had a few setbacks, had a few knockbacks. Kept building, kept building, kept building, but because he's a nice guy, like, yeah. he doesn't alienate people. That's and I've, I've seen, I've, you always know, just see that growth. Mm. And even when you got Joe, and people said he's in over his head, I was like, nah, mm. he's he's smart. He was yeah. Eighty like, percent of boxing is intelligence. People think it's knowledge. It's not knowledge. No. It's intelligence. It's, it's, it's yeah, definitely um, as well willing to learn and which yeah. uh, you say he's done it with Shane and all that he's been in the corners and everything yeah. I know a good friend of yours which do you know what I love and I think he'll be one of the best trainers in there Danelle Smith you know oh, I think, Big Don yeah yeah I, I really really do like him I really rate him as well and he just wants to learn all the time and I've always noticed that about him and he was in the Sims camp for ages even with AJ and all that and he's just learned and you know I reckon you know he, he he's you know ready to do that. I think you do good things with Courtney Bennett. I really do think that they're a good they're a good match with each yeah. other. Uh, did, well, bloody, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like, like this this is my case study for success if it is. Yeah. Um, I think with me when I look when I look at that pairing. All they have to do is just demand more of each other. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's that's it. If because if they if they're hungry to be the the greatest then and. and like I sit there and I say to myself, because I got asked this question, they said, mate, what do you want to do in boxing? Because I get asked this a lot, because I do a lot of things in boxing. So what do you actually want to do? And I said, for me, if you gave me all the money in the world, all I'd do is open up an amateur gym and train kids. Yeah. And all I'd want to do is win the ABAs. Yeah. Yeah. Don't care about the Olympics anymore. Just want to win. I want people to, to come to my gym the same way they go up to the Ingle gym. Yeah. And you know what quality went through those Absolutely. doors. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why. That's all I care about. And yeah. people say, "So you want to be a coach?" And I say, "I think I'm more now. I'm more of a director of boxing." Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like I'm a bit. I'm a bit suity now, Alfred. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a, I'm a bit. I'm a bit suity. One of them yeah, yeah. I, I like to just point, that's point it. and talk. <laughs> I don't do the pads oh, anymore. Yeah. I just point and talk. That's it. Yeah, I give, yeah. I give advice and guidance. <laughs> but it is that. That's what enjoys me. That, that's what, and I always say to people, there's one thing about boxing everyone enjoys. All the other bits are nice, but there's that one thing that draws you in. For me, it will always be fighters and gyms. Yeah. I don't know what it is for you as a manager, because you, yeah. you might just love the, the game. I just, I, I do, but you know yeah. what? You're saying that, Terry, honestly. <laughs> there's so many, you know, honestly. And, and, and that, that is the, really the joy of having a team as well. Because you know I've got a low tolerance, especially for bullshitters and um, and really two-faced people, because yeah. there's so many of them, managers, promoters, and you know what? As well, blaggers, so many of them, and you know I get, 
you know, that I, I, I never, listen, if, if, it's, if it's that bad, I'll confront it and I'll have it out. I, I'm not, not afraid to, to ever do that. But, you know, if, if someone does anything to me in a professional game, I, do you know what? I just drop them out and I make them know that I've dropped them out as well. I just, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be civil to people and all that, but I ain't got the time, I ain't got the energy to, to waste of it, you know. I, I used to be crash bang wallop and all that, especially... Um, in boxing if someone done something and all that but I've learned as I got older do you know what just drop drop them out now but that's the beauty of having the team because you know I still want to I still want to I have to do by right by our fighters you know I can't just say I'm not dealing with that one because you know I've got a personal thing against them and all that because I wouldn't be doing my job as a manager I've got, I've got to have all avenues but you know people that I haven't got no patience with I haven't got the time of day for and there's a few of them in this sport, that's why I've got a good team. You know, if I don't want to deal with them, one of my brothers will deal with them, and uh, like, and vice versa. If my bro my brothers don't want to deal with someone, I I deal with them, and all that. And that's that's probably the beauty of having a team. But you know, in professional boxing, I remember someone told me before. You know, I won't say the word, but they say you will meet more see you next Tuesdays in boxing than you'll meet in your entire life outside of it. And I tell you what, they was right. It was really, really right, and um, you know. But I do. I, I've got. I've got. I've got some great friends in in boxing as well. Some good, good law friends, and you know, I love going to the shows. I love having a laugh with them and all that. And you know, it's it's good because we, we can mix that with the fight. I, I do like being on a fight night, especially with my fighter as well. You know, being in a big fight, it's such a buzz. Yeah. It really, really is. And when obviously when they win, it's an even bigger buzz than to think that I've took them there as well but um, that's the, yeah it's exactly what I do it for as well but I just don't want to you know be sucked into some of this you know boxing bubble thing where everyone's you know uh, like it's just it, it's cringe some of this stuff well like matchroom Did you, don't answer don't answer don't answer you don't have to answer I'll say it <laughs> no 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 not even that though no, it's, it's, it's do you know like some trainers managers you know, who are so far, and they're publicly doing it, you know, YouTube videos and tweets and things, and you think to myself, my goodness me, it's just like, you know, show me some attention. They want to pat on the back from all the big wigs and all that. That's not me whatsoever. That, that really, really ain't me. And, you know, some people will probably go, you know, they'll go the extra mile and all that, but sometimes I like to have a little bit of dignity, but some of these guys haven't, you know. And, uh, you know, some people going out there bashing other people because it will please that promoter. They want to be seen pleasing a certain promoter. Oh, look, I'm doing this for you. I'm, I'm doing a PR job for you. They're not even being asked to do it. They're actually doing it off their own back to do it, which is, you know, you're not even, get, not, not, even getting, <laughs> not even getting paid to do it or anything like that. It's just, it's, it's madness. Do you, do you know, one of my friends described it perfectly. He just went, boxing is just full of bag carriers. That's what he said. Boxing is just full of bag carriers, people who will do it for free just to say that they were there. And he was like, "There's no value." Like that's why boxing is is, is a joke of a sport. But you know what it comes from? All of this stuff, Alf. I think men. There's a large chunk of men who want to submit to other men, and the reward for that's a pat on the back. Well yeah. done. They want to submit. Well, yeah. like I'll, I'll call it just men that twerk. You know those guys. Like you can imagine them in like pink hot pants just twerking for someone just to get a pat on the back. Yeah. And there's a lot of that in boxing. Oh. A lot of these guys who talk tough, and you see all the tribal tattoos, all this, but they love twerking. They love yeah. twerking for Eddie Hearn. Ah, oh, Eddie, anything you want, man. I got you, yeah, don't worry. And what does Eddie Hearn do? Just there, puppet master, just going, look at all these idiots. Look at what they'll do for me. No, no wonder I get away with everything. You're just like... Just I, be a, I feel, I be feel, a I feel it goes along even not not even so much you know matchroom. I think it goes along with some low like every promotional thing. They just want to keep people happy. But I think to myself, goodness me. And do you know the thing about it is though, Terry, they'll fall out of them over something, and then do you know what I mean? Like it's it's all for nothing. They'll have a fall out, and then it'll be a hatchet job on them. Right. So yeah. you know it's it's. It's, 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 a lot, it's a lot of crap and all that. Especially people, you know, like sticking up for, you know, and trying, trying to do a PR job for, for promotional companies as well. 
You're not gaining nothing out of it, so what do you care? Why are you going out? That's, their business is their business. Their business with that person is their business. Nothing to do with you. Why are you interjecting? And most of them don't even get asked their opinions. They just flatten it off, and it's just... But you know the, you, you know the certain people in the boxing, and you know everyone knows and sees... I, 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 I genuinely believe this. If you took our top promoters in this country and pull their trousers down, there would be men who would put their hand up to... I'll stop them. <laughs> they would. They, 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 they would beg to do it. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't have to force them. Like, you could put the gun to the side. Like, yeah. no, no, no. They'd be like, I'll just do it because yeah. it's who I am. Well, listen, if that's... If, if, listen, like you say, some of these people, they're blaggers, and, that's the, and if that's their way of doing right by their fighter and losing their dignity, then fine, do that, you know? Um, but, you know, I, I, I believe what we're doing is... Absolutely fine. We we work, you know, we work with our fighters, and we we, we we don't have to we don't have to sell our souls to get our fighters a good deal. And that's that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we we've got we've got a bit of integrity about us, I think. But shame that most it's not saying most, but shame some people, especially high, um, you know, high high end, you know, managers and whatever can't do the same. But I suppose that's the world we live in. So where do you see yourself in three years, mate? I would love to see myself with um, a couple of world champions, a couple of, and that's it. Because I mean, the, the core group that we got now, Terry, you know, Masood Abdullah, James Hennigan, Casey Kademi, you know, we signed all them from debut. I mean, Casey, not so much, but we signed all them from debut. So, you know, um, we, we, we've been doing a great job. You know, young Jack McGann, I know he came up short and got caught cold last time, but the job we've done for him is fantastic. Um, you know, Masood, we, we've done that. And all these guys have signed contracts extensions of us. So that, that, that just goes to show, you know, what we're doing is, is right. But yeah, in three years' time, I'd definitely love to have a couple of world champions. I'd love to, you know, add to our stable quality of fighters. And, you know, champions at all level, world, British, European, southern area, all of them. I'd just love a stable full of champions. And we're, we're, we're going on the right path for it. And then here's a question I've got before we actually talk about some of the, the current affairs in boxing. Have you ever got that emotional lag? And I, always t I talk to people in boxing about this. And it's when you build up a real relationship with someone and they leave you, right? And you're like, and in your head, you don't say public, but in your head you're like, but after everything I did for you, you can just walk away like that. And then you, you've almost got this thing of, because you'd had so much in your head, like this is all the stuff I had planned for yeah. us to do. And you just, and I don't think people in boxing understand this. Like, there's this real period where I don't, it's not anger and it's not upset and it's not hurt, but it's this kind of, this kind of like weird emotional fog mm. where you're like, I can't believe that's all done now. You, that, yeah, because yeah. you, you just think you, you put so much of your life into it and your time. I think that's what it is more than anything. And, um, you know, for it not to be appreciated and all that, but listen, you see, you see it in so many sports now at the high level. Once you get to that high level, no one wanted to know you then when you when you was fighting on undercards, not on TV, on small halls and all that. Once you get a bit of recognition, but you know, the fighters have got to have that in them where they just go, Do you know what? Where were you lot before and all that? You call yourself big boxing people. None of you lot mentioned me. None of you. Ever, ever, I never see you at a York Hall show. I never see that. So, what you know, what's going on? They're they're purely for their own financial gain and all that. And listen, we're we're here for financial gain as well. We're not doing it for free and all that. But you know, we we never take advantage, especially with, pay, um, with what the fighters pay us as well, which is which I think is a good selling point to our management company as well, because you know we we don't have um, we don't you know our fee is one of the lowest, definitely in the in professional boxing without a shadow of a doubt. And um, yeah, I just, I've never, to be honest with you, I, I've, I've got, um, it, it could happen in the future. I don't think I've ever experienced it that much, to be honest with you, Terry, anyway. And if I have, and if I have experienced a fighter going and I, I can't remember having that feeling, obviously I didn't have that emotional connection with them. But um, I hope it doesn't happen, but <laughs> It's boxing, yeah. so it is going to yeah, happen. Yeah. It is going to happen down the road. One hundred percent, right? Yeah. Let, let's let's slide into some of the current affairs because people love all this because they they already know my views on stuff, so they don't really care. You saw the fight on Sunday, right? Fraser yeah. against Fabio. What did you make of that? 
it was it was a good fight for the level it was at, and that's that's exactly what it was. Um, it, I, I listen. It, it it was a war. It was a war, but it wasn't. You know, it, it, it was a it was a good British solid British title fight. I think. Um, you know, a bit over the top. I think people are saying it's one of the best fights they've seen on these shores of all time. It was good. It was brilliant, but I think people are just getting a bit ahead of themselves. Maybe they were saying that after the fight because, you know, you, you, you lost in the moment and all that sort of stuff. But um, for what it was, it was a good, solid fight. It was good. I, do you know what? I actually enjoyed the card. I thought they put a great event on Boxer that night. Um, I think, um, yeah, it, but, but the, the fight was what it was. Um, it was just, I think... Especially after like six rounds, it was just um, pure guts and thinking that was just fighting on instinct and all that sort of stuff. I don't think it was pretty at times, but you know, it, it was what it was. It was a good, solid fight, but not one of the best of all time. Because <laughs> the way I described it was, it was like one of those fights from the early 80s, wasn't it? Like, yeah. you know, where you get like a Mike Weaver against, uh, I don't know, Tony Tubbs or. Yeah. It was one of those, wasn't it? Yeah, where yeah, it'd be yeah, a 15 yeah. rounder and yeah. you're watching it going, I don't know if these men will be the same afterwards. No, that's right. And I, I, I absolutely, I think, especially that fight, I think that probably took a little bit out of them, especially being the age that Fraser is now as well. And Fabio, you know, I just think, um, I, I don't know. I just, just um, I don't think they will be the same after that. But run it, run it straight back. What are you waiting for? Run it straight back. So as a manager, you'd run it straight back. You I wouldn't. You wouldn't say, uh... Not straight back. I think they need a long rest after that, though. <laughs> like, I think they really, really do. But do you know what? Why not? I mean, what, what are you waiting for? Listen, that's the level. That's the level that you want to go beyond. So that's your unfinished business. Go go and do it. You're going to get paid handsomely for it. Um, you know, I don't... I, honestly, if I'm the manager of either of those fighters, I'm thinking to myself, you can beat this guy. This ain't, like... He could beat you. You can beat him. There was nothing between them, really. You can go in there and beat him. Why not? Roll the dice on it. Roll the dice on it. I don't understand why you wouldn't. I, I, I think I, I'm confident that I would actually put my fight back in there. Not straight away. But I think they need a long rest after that. But I think yeah. both their next fights should be that. Because I'm because because I, I I took the opposite view where I said mm. I'd keep them away from each other for a while. Mm. And the reason I do that is. I don't believe they would fight that way again. And I think no. the second fight would actually be a, a massive disappointment. The thing, yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Y yeah. You almost want to yeah. have them have a couple of wins each, get, yeah. get complacent again, get cocky again, and then go, right, the, let's fight. The thing is, though, um, Terry, who do you put them in with? Who, who do you put them in? What, what, what caliber of fight would you put them in with to, while they wait to fight each other? Because... So, I think you can put like I, I, I pulled out the names like names like Michael Hunter. You know names. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because look, if you look at Fraser, yes, he's nineteen stone, but he doesn't bang like he's nineteen stone. Yeah. So you need he needs he needs to fight smaller guys, mm. right? Fabio's shown that he's all right against people his own size, yeah. but he doesn't want someone too crafty. Yeah. So you start matching accordingly. Like you could put Fabio Wardley in with FA at Jagba, mm. and I think he's competitive in that fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that would build his name again. Yeah. And then you could put Fraser in with Michael Hunter, and we'd all understand Michael Hunter because of the Martin Bacoli yeah. thing. There are a couple of good fights where you cement yourself as not at that top, not, not at the Saudi yeah. table, as we call it, but you're kind of underneath there. Yeah. And then you go, right, now you two fight. And you might get the call from Turkey. Yeah. Well, that's, listen... Especially on the heavyweight scene, that's what they're waiting for yeah. now, aren't they? Yeah. Everyone's waiting for that call and all that. But, I mean... Do you think that's killing the sport? What's that? Do you think that's killing the sport? Kill, what, with the um, waiting? No, I think, do you know what? To be honest with you, with that Saudi, um, with the Saudi call up, I think, um, I actually do think that it, it's, it's a benefit because I think that people are just going to start perform. They're going, right, I've got them watching me now. I need to up my game. I need to be better because if I'm listen, they're they're picking the top qualified. Um, an example of that, and he took a shine to him. Okay, I shake is Mark Chamberlain. You know, he's fought out of his skin and he's fighting over there a second time. Um, it's I, I I think that it will make people up their game with the thing. Um, in in regards to 
you know, is it, is it killing it over here? Um, not, I, don't, I don't think, listen, it, it is going over there, but um, I, I don't think so. I, 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 think, I think that you're going to see more domestic clashes now because, you know, the, the, the promoters have got to deliver these fights now for the British public. So all these other fighters, like the British title fight um, things, I want to put them in with him. I think you're going to see some interesting matchups over here as well but I mean the big boys it's the same listen it is the same I know people keep going on about it but you get to that certain level Tyson Fury fought over here done that and he went over to Vegas for his um, first few fights and all that because that's what the, the money was and that's what they wanted him over there so um, you know I, I think it would be benefit I think that it is beneficial to the sport the Saudi Arabian money and, and as a manager I want my fighters over there as well I do I want them fighting over there I want them fighting on the big stages and I want the most eyeballs on them possible. And at the moment, that's what Saudi are doing. Yeah, it's occurred to me, you've actually been out there. What is it like when you get out there? Oh, yeah, I went out there with um, Jack McGann. Um, on Twice, the... right? No, no, I didn't go out there the second time. Um, Jack, Jack was at, obviously fought out there. Um, and um, I went over there in October. It, do you know what? It, the, the hospitality they show you over there is madness. You actually, you know, if... if I, don't, I don't know what it is like with all the other people that go out there that are not involved in the boxing but you land on that airplane and you're with the team and you know you are you treat you actually got like the rock star treatment over there and they can't do enough for you over there and all that um and it is it's it's it's, it's, it's quite a nice um place to visit it's some nice places down um in there and all that um and you know, it's um, it's a different culture over there, and it's interesting to see. It's just I think it's just the same as going to any other country and see, seeing what what they're like. It's just um, yeah, it's good. I mean, the, the production over there and everything what they put on over there was fantastic, and um, it, it, it's it's not a bad fight. I mean, they were saying a lack of atmosphere as well. I've seen that on the telly, but I remember when Jack was fighting over there, I and mean, it was in a little, the little small arena before you went to the big arena. And it was like mostly locals around there, but it, 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 even the shots were. I don't know what it sounded like on telly because I never watched it. But even the shots, like where they catch your arm and all that, even the crowd are going whoa, and you can hear the noise in there like that, like it, even the meaningful things and all that. So I, I think it sounded a bit more different than because when people went over there, especially with um, Fury and in Garnu, when I went over there, when Fury got knocked down, the place went nuts. And um, but the people sound on the telly lack of atmosphere I don't think it was that bad over there don't get me wrong it wasn't like a packed out O2 or a packed yeah. out Wembley Arena where everyone's just screaming singing along and all that nothing like yeah. that I don't think it's as bad as what people are portraying it but obviously you must be seeing must be seeing something different on telly than you actually got to be there I suppose so. but I, I said to a mate I said there's also a lack of cocaine in Saudi Arabia <laughs> so that, that could influence do you know the... what that's what I'm saying but do you know what that's a good thing because I'll tell you yeah. what, I didn't see many fights in the crowd. And that, do you know what? I hate that. It's, it just spoils it because you know what it's like. Oh. The, the average boxing fan watches it. Being a bit they, cheeky, you're a Warren. You, you, know, you know how oh, it used to be until. Freaking, it's just yeah. it's, it's, it's madness, like on the, some of the shows and all that. And you do, you just get complete fucking idiots. And, and some of them, not even boxing fans, you just get, you know, you, you'd never see some of these going to a local amateur show or a local your call show. No, it's just. Oh, there's a big fight. What was it? Clark and Wardley and all that. I don't know what I'm looking at, but everyone's going, so I've got to go. Wait, Carlin Cocaine kick off. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, well, do you know what? That, that, that's what that drug does to you. It, <laughs> makes you. it makes you think that you can take the world on. I was going to ask you this one there. Yeah. Manager's head on. What do you make of that Dalton Smith Adam Azim thing? Well, it's been, it's been ordered by the board. It, they, to be honest with you, I think that they should have pulled him out of the purse a bit early. But let's stop that. listen, to be honest with you, um, it's, it's smart what Eddie's doing, PR-wise and all that. But would I put Adam Azim in with Dalton Smith? I think he got pushed on a bit. He should never have fought for that European title, first of all, Adam Azim. He should never, he'd been brought, brought along very fast. But he has got the talent to go all the way and all that. You know what? He's a live dog in the Dalton Smith fight. Don't get me wrong. He is. But he just hasn't had the fights and the experience with it. Um, Harlem Eubank fight. I think it's a tough fight for him, especially at the stage of the career. But that, that's just... The, I think that's what's happened. Is um, He's been thrusted into the spotlight. And it's, it's the same thing. Say if you was, yeah, you won a European title, now you can't go back. Yeah. 
on that level. That's the thing. If you go backwards, you know, you can only go forwards. I just think he was just pushed on a little bit too um, thing. I don't think it's the right time for that, Adam Azim. But then, do you know what? Saying that, I mean, if I was managing Adam Azim, probably not. So, because, but what's the process there, right? Because we don't know who's managing Adam Azim, really, do we? McWilliams, mate. Okay. You, 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 you never know. I, I don't ask too many questions yeah. about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a promoter talking, but if I'm a manager, I'm like, no, what do you mean fight Dalton Smith? Yeah. What, why now? Yeah. Well, well, that's the thing as well. That's why I feel a bit sorry for Ben Shalom as well, because ultimately, it ain't just the promoter's yeah. choice. It is the manager's choice. That's why, you in, that's, that's why you've got a manager. I'm sure Adam Azim want to... Um, fight Dalton Smith tomorrow. Absolutely, I think he fancies his chances against that. But um, you know, listen, Shane and Barry McGuigan are going to know their fighter. You know, they're with him day in day out, so they're going to know their fighter more, even better than what Ben Shalom knows him. You know, they're with him every single day. And if listen, if they if they want to pull out of that, I don't know if it's an ego thing, because listen, we had this before. And it could be a promoter's war thing that they don't want now and there. I remember we had it before, Terry Flanagan and Andy Crawler. How did we never see that fight? But the only offer that was going in to make that fight was from Queensbury, because I, 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 was, I, I see it firsthand. They were the ones making the offers. Not once did Matram ever make Queensbury an offer for Anthony Crawler to fight. Um, they, I remember they, was doing, they was going to do the sealed bid things and all that. Who's going to get the fight? That was a whole concept for it. It might just be a warring thing with the promoters. I don't know, but I think um, it's just I think they're putting out of the purse bid things quite too often is just give the fans, you know, a loaded gun to, to to start on you and all that. But you know, with with Ben Shalom and all that, I, I, he, he's young. He, he's 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 been he's been thrusted into the big time and all that. And he's learning. I don't, I don't. I don't think he's doing a terrible job. But you know, I got. What should I say? Matchroom, Eddie Earn, and all that. They're great at PR. Yeah. They're great. At, you know, they're great talkers. And you know, they're doing a hatchet job on them at the moment. Yeah, and they're really. Yeah. And I, and I feel for him because because Hearn did the thing. Was it yesterday or the day before? Where he starts listing all the fights that haven't happened. Mm. And I'm like, it's always where the matchroom guy's got more experience. Yeah. It's never where the matchroom guy's the underdog. I think, I think that the one thing I think um, Ben did say, which I did agree with the other day, is why wouldn't you want to fight Adam Azim right now? I thought, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, listen, you can, I, you can tell Dalton Smith's more at his peak than what Adam Azim is, really. It, and everyone keeps mentioning about George Groves and Degal. It's, no, that's, it's not the same at all. They was absolutely parallel careers, George Groves. So when they got to the British title fight, they were parallel careers. That's what it is. But I think that the, the, the thing that's really messed them up is he should never have fought for the European title because once he'd done that and they give the free reign for, you know, as soon as he won that European title, you know for a fact that Matchroom and Dalton Smith's managers on the phone to that EBU, make him manager, make, make, and listen, that's what I do. I have to do it with the Commonwealth, to do it with all the world titles. You, that is your job. You get your fighter to get in that position. So as soon as he won that, you knew that that's what was going to do. And you put your case forward to the EBU, going, this is going to be the bigger fight, bang, bang. They want their title in the prestigious nights. They want a, their title seen on the big shows and everything. So, you know, they've done what they've had to do. But, yeah, definitely I think that he's um, he's been pushed a little bit too far now and now they've got to rein it in. They've got to rein it in and, um, you know, listen, Adam, get on with what you've got to do. Everyone forget about this soon anyway. Just yeah, get the, on with the, the fight will happen. Of course it'll happen. It, it's, it's, like, it's like, look, it's like with Fraser Clark and Wardley, right? Yeah. Are we glad we waited the extra few months? Probably. Probably. I think, I think if, yeah, I think so. Because honestly, I honestly think if they would have fought at that time, I think Fabio, especially the momentum Fabio had, I think he would have blasted Fraser Clark out of there. Yeah. So maybe that was, a, that, that, that was a good job on their part. It's hard when they order it, though, because someone's got to back down. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, if your fighter ain't got the experience and all that, you've got to do a job and all that. But, uh, yeah. but I, I, I've said it before. Ben's got to have a plan now, mm. not to go after Matchroom, just to go after Eddie. He's got to have his little chess pieces in place, right? Yeah. And then he can start putting pressure on Eddie. Because yeah. you want to see him do interviews where he goes, look, We've made an offer to Matchroom. Mm. They've gone very quiet. Yeah. yeah, the money's here. It, once he starts putting that pressure, 
And then, you know, that's when you start to see Eddie start squirming. Yeah. yeah. Well, they all do. Listen, I'm not being funny. You get so many, f like, not just promoters, everyone. They all act tough on YouTube. I've seen it firsthand. They act tough on YouTube. You see them in person. They're completely different. It's, it's all a persona. It's all, a, it's all an act. It's, a, it's, it's, it's all bullshit at the end of the day. Yeah. Especially with that. But, you know, but they've, they've created an audience now. Loads of people, especially the YouTubers, have created an audience where people buy into it and all that and think that people are what they are. With it, with what they're not, you know? You yeah, yeah, just don't want to bump into the wrong people. <laughs> well, that's it. That's what I'm saying. Listen, keep your mouth shut yeah. and all that. And if you've got, you've got something to say, and that's what, oh, yeah, I always say it. Loads, loads of people, especially in boxing, you know, I, I would have loved to, the character, because I remember, know, know some of them, it's been my old man telling me as well, some of the characters in the boxing in the 90s, that's when I would have loved to have worked in boxing yeah. because that was when it was like proper. I mean, some of the guys... You know, <laughs> working boxing now, I'm thinking they just don't suit. It don't suit. I don't know what it is, but maybe the landscape's changing the sport and all that. And, um, yeah. Like, like everything, it just becomes gentrified, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. You know, I you think know, so. You know, showing up in Dolce and Gabbana. It's not, it's not like it used to be. That's what I'm saying. Oh, God. And that, do you know what? I don't, I don't want to be that person. I don't no, want to be that I don't person. want to. And I just see it. I mean, even the presenters, like on the TNT, I used to love that in the 90s. I'm suiting a booty, tied up, doing all that sort of stuff. Come on, listen. You're supposed to be taking, you know, it takes pride. Now, people, people are like live on big fights on Sky Sports wearing tracksuits. I'm like, it's just no class about it. But also, I keep saying that the average age of boxing fans goes up every year. Yeah. Putting kids on doesn't really help your audience. No. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, exactly that. But just okay. conscious that you've got domestic duties to attend to pretty much <laughs> now, mate. Any, a, anything you need to, to get off your chest to, to share with the world? Nothing. Listen, Terry, I'm, sure, just, I'm very, very pleased we finally had the meet yeah. to come on the podcast. I'm a big fan of your podcast. I've always said that about the podcast. Make sure, make sure Frank listens. Make sure Uncle Frank listens. Oh, listen, listen. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure they listen. I'm just, listen, the thing I love about this as well, you know, it's a balanced view. Listen, some of the things I don't agree with what you say, but I'll tell you what, I respect the things you say and all that. But it's not, you know, I, I see some of these YouTube channels and it kills them to give credit to other things, you know. If someone does something right, you'll give credit to them and that's it. It kills them and they'll find holes in everything and all that. And that's what I've always said. I love, love listening to your podcast and you give a balanced view. And you know what? You're, you're, you're doing absolutely really well, Terry. You should be proud of it. Doing it, mate, mate. Do you know what? Being honest, ju just trying, and you'll know this because in your game it's similar. Mm. You always see what other people are doing, and it takes a lot of discipline to block it out yeah. and go. That's what you got to do. I've got my mission. Yes. Yeah, and every day I've just got to get better at my mission. Exactly. And then it happens. But one of the other thing you learn as well doing this is it's never a straight line up. No, it's not. Like, mate, I get months and I look at the numbers. I'm like, fuck, we ain't going. No. Nowhere. We ain't going. Exactly. Nowhere. And then it will just kick on, and I'm like. How? Yeah. And you just realise that actually life is about doing loads and loads of stuff that doesn't get credit mm. and then bang, it all comes together at one moment and you just find another level. Listen, it's the same, the same with that. I could have a bunch of fighters, you know, all going on a losing streak. Some of my fighters you think, oh, goodness me. You love it when it's, you love it when it's going high, but do you know what? You have to have the lows to appreciate the highs. And that's, that's, that's a saying that I've always stood by and all that. And um, listen, I'm on a similar path to you as well. Terry, you know what I mean? Especially, with, I'm not a baby at the game. I've been, I've been working behind the scenes for the thingy, but as far as management goes, you know, especially my fighters, we're, we're just growing exactly the same. So, you know. That's all you want. That's it. That's it. And, I mean, this will keep going. Just keep away from morons. <laughs> that's it. Easy and that's easier said than done. The time. There you go. <laughs> and on that note, let, let's tap up. Mate, thank you so much. Terry, Mate, appreciate pleasure, that. Mate. No one's going to see the handshake, but there was a handshake. <laughs> Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah. So I hope you guys enjoyed that because I did. I thought it was a fascinating conversation. Um, the 80 or 90 minutes flew by. Um, I know I know, I was uncomfortable just being sat on the floor. I'm not built for sitting on the floor anymore. And so you'll hear the microphone shift a few times that interview just <laughs> just having to cope with the discomfort. Now we're we're not evolved to sit on the floor anymore, unfortunately. But now, really grateful to Alpha for being a sport. I could see there was a point when I was like, uh, he just wants this done because it's uncomfortable. So we got what we needed to get out of the episode and then we, we kind of just had to wrap it up just for our own physical safety and health. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, 
it's given me the urge to do a bit more of that, just being outside. Um, you never know, man. I might eventually get that that Spider Richards interview. We'll see. But no, really enjoyed that. Grateful to everyone that helped. Now, thanks to Amy and Newman, Rival Boxing Gym. Like I said at the beginning, it's definitely worth a stopover. If, you, if you're anywhere near the Cali Road and you want somewhere to train boxing, just pop down. Um, good people, friendly vibe, really, really nice. And if, if that's going to be the base of operations for, for Stevie Broughton's team, for example, then you mean you're going to be around a lot of really good people and, I mean, some good trainers there as well. So, yeah, make the most of that opportunity and, you know, let me know what you guys think. I mean, as always, let's keep the conversation going. If you like the content, share it. Let's bring people in. The one thing I did want to say, if you ask me what I took away from that interview, like my headline in my head was, even if you're a Warren, boxing's a hard, hard game. Like, you know, you've got the right name, but you've still got to do all the other stuff everyone has to do. You still have to go through the same pain. Boxing's just a hard game. That's, that's the conclusion we all draw here. Boxing's just a hard, hard game to get right. And so when people get it right, we should congratulate them. And, you know, when they get it wrong, we should be honest, but we should also learn from it. And on that note, I'll say take care, guys, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Pop, pop, bang! Porky's Corner is proud to be sponsored by Spartan Sight Solutions. They are specialists in civil engineering and demolition contracts for the construction industry. Interested parties should visit their website or contact Porky's Corner for a referral at porkycorner at mail.com